Welcome to South Seas ABE and this is the Cyber War in Perspective Analysis from the Crisis in Ukraine being presented by Kenneth Gears. Uh, last few notes. Today this is the last talk of the day obviously. Uh, there is the business hall. You'll be able to go there tomorrow for all the great vendor stuff that's happening. And then also this evening from 5.30 until not, uh, 7 o'clock is the welcome reception also there in the business hall downstairs in B -side, Bayside AB. Uh, the Black Hat Arsenal I believe closes in about a half an hour but I should be open all day tomorrow as well so definitely check that out in the Palm Foyer. And finally this evening at 6.30 in Mandalay Bay BCD which is just down the hall are the Pony Awards. So with that let's uh, go right into the talk. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm uh, Kenneth Gears. I'm with Komodo, and uh, and I've been living for the last two years in Ukraine. Uh, so I got together with uh, NATO uh, to put a, together a book on the uh, the crisis there, specifically the cyber dimension. Uh, this this slide I think is important in the age of. Um, I don't know, information operations in cyberspace uh, uh, because it's funny how I guess easy it is to deny something. You know, Russia has denied that, that those are its tanks in eastern Ukraine uh, or that its malicious code is on the DNC server. Um, in this case, you can see that a lot of people showed up for this, this event uh, and it looks pretty much like a, a, a revolution, I would say, if you get that many uh, folks together. Now, in their pockets, all of these people have a cell phone today. These are not lighters and this is not a journey concert. <laughs> and the, the thing is, is all of these are basically small supercomputers, right, that can be targeted uh, for, you know, the three basic forms of cyber attack, right, uh, as uh, reading your stuff, uh, stopping you from reading your stuff, or changing your stuff, right? Um, because we all basically are looking at this little device all day uh, and we're using it not only to show that we're participating in a revolution but we use it to get you know, information from our, our friends and our government. Now uh, during Maidan also on the street uh, the attacks were targeted enough that people on different streets got different messages. Uh, you're getting too close to the presidential palace, uh, etc. Um, so the Russian reaction to this, uh, if you can see the map, you can see how important Ukraine is in geopolitics, right? Um, if you're sitting in Moscow, uh, it is a very important piece. Putin himself is called uh, Kiev, the mother of all Russian cities. Uh, and you probably don't need to, say, to, to think much more to see how uh, important it is from the Russian perspective. And you can see in the middle, uh, that's the eastern part of Ukraine that is now uh, divided up with uh, tanks, soldiers, and also uh, uh, information operations in cyberspace. Uh, so this is the uh, NATO Cyber Center. If you haven't been there, I've been associated with it since well before its beginning. I moved to, to Estonia in 2007 to help put together the Cyber Center, uh, actually in which uh, my move coincided with the, uh, the cyber attacks of 2007, actually, uh, that took place there. Uh, that were a broad denial of service against the country and one, and one of the first sort of uses of uh, cyber warfare, let's say, tactics for international coercion uh, between uh, nation states. Um, so what we wanted to do is think about, well, this current conflict in Ukraine, uh, it has uh, clearly a, uh, there's a hot war on the ground. You have two countries that have uh, in expertise in information technology uh, and expertise in hacking. So is there a cyber dimension? And if so, uh, what is it? Um, there's a lot of open questions. Does cyber war even exist? Uh, and if so, how do we manage it? That's the international norms part. Uh, which is really important, uh, particularly since hacking is not really something you can do overnight. Uh, and so that means militaries are kind of faced with the uh, uncomfortable task of hacking a lot in peacetime in order to get ready for theoretical wars that may never happen. 
right? So think you're, you know, Colonel so and so, and you're responsible for, you know, for making sure that the adversary doesn't surprise you, or or that you can take down the adversary uh, in some possible war. That's that's your challenge, and and there's going to be a lot of hacking involved because that's what people do, whether you're a student or a professor or a soldier or a spy today, uh, right? So here is uh, the Warsaw communique just from last month, right? There was a big NATO summit. I don't know if you saw this in the news uh, in, in Poland. Uh, and basically, they adopted the notion, uh, just as has the United States and many other countries, that cyberspace is a domain of warfare. You may agree with that, disagree with it, but it doesn't really matter. Basically, the, the world's most powerful military alliance got together and said, it is so, right? So you can see clear. Um, as harmful as conventional attack, this will be a core task, and this is uh, a domain of ours. And you can see how big the space is and how many countries are involved. So if you were in charge of that huge space of defending it against uh, an adversary, uh, you can imagine the kinds of things that are, the kinds of briefings you're getting and the kinds of planning sessions you're having is going to be big. So there are a lot of cyber war skeptics out there, and that's fine, that's a good thing. Um, but so I thought, well, I would just go back to kind of some basic literature. Uh, and I did this for actually numerous countries. And I just decided to pick out the US Army uh, manual because it just may be the most uh, um, uh, di di relevant to the audience here. Uh, and also, I was in the US Army. Uh, 1993, I went into signals intelligence school, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the. Um, if, these are direct quotes uh, from FM. If you're out, if you're from the army, uh, you'll recognize uh, the FMs. Uh, 338 uh, from 2014. Uh, so you can see that from a military perspective, the idea is to use cyberspace to project power, uh, to uh, not only take on the enemy but the adversary. And that word, that word is a little bit more. Um, vague and, and that also is interesting in, in the, because with hacking you're going have to have to hack your way through a lot of civilian infrastructure, a lot of third party countries in order to get to your target, right? So it's possible to cause physical damage uh, and, it, and it's, it's not just a tangible but it's more intangible in the sense of who you're going after and what you're going after. So not only uh, a thing like a network or router or something, uh, but a cyber persona that may be, you know, in different, um, in different websites, in different servers, in different parts of the world. Uh, this is this makes the the challenge, of course, uh, um, very interesting from an attacker or, or defender's uh, perspective, um, and within public infrastructure, right? So it's possible that that the uh, the military attacks will take place uh, in an environment where hospitals and schools uh, and government services may may be affected. Now on the Russian side of things, uh, since we're going to talk a little bit about Russia in this presentation, uh, it's important to just, and this could be from any country's perspective, right, it, that computer network operations, they're just a, a piece in a larger puzzle, right? Uh, the way it works in Washington, a lot of you I'm sure are also from Washington, you, get, you have these things called national security requirements. And they come from the White House. And the White House says, today, uh, Syria is important to us, Russia is important to us, the South China Sea is important to us. And these things filter down into agencies, right? And they put them in their own language and use their own means and methods uh, to get this information um, or to do something uh, relative to that uh, national security requirement. And so uh, Russian SIGINT, uh, this, if you know this story, some of you I'm sure do, but it's the great seal that was given by the school children uh, to the U.S. ambassador in Moscow on August the 6th, August the 4th, sorry, in 1945. So this is before the end of the war. And this is a phenomenal piece of technology, right? Uh, so the ambassador was so proud of this, he put it above his desk, it sat there for years. And it was so sophisticated, even from 1945, uh, that the, uh, the Russian intelligence could remotely turn it on and listen to all the conversations in the ambassador's office, right? Did so for years. So there's Russian planes and trawlers, and, and of course, first class militaries, they all have these. As well as, if you've read any of the latest books on cyber espionage, you'll see that there is a a uh, healthy human aspect to uh, computer network operations, 
right? You may have a network that is air gapped or you may have a network that we don't know anything about, let's say, uh, and there is going to be interplay then between SIGINT and HUMINT, right? You have to send somebody across a border to a conference in a building. There's probably, I don't know how many people in this room right now that are basically going to go back and they're going to write a report that's going to go into a classified stream uh, to their government. So here's the authors we had in the book. Um, you'll see there's some really great thinkers on here from Lubicki, Baitlick, Lewis. I'm going to highlight just two because this is a short presentation. Uh, two Ukrainian guys, the chief of CERT UA and Isaka Kiev. Uh, just in a couple of slides uh, before we move on, but just to give you a taste of what's in the book. Uh, and the book is free uh, by chapter or uh, the whole book. And also the, the, the NATO Cyber Center uh, Library also. If you, uh, if you um, miss this link, let's say, you can always just think, oh, there's a NATO cyber center in Estonia, and now we have hundreds of uh, reports uh, and books and, and, and publications there. So the chief of CERT UA basically made the case uh, that as geopolitical tension rose in the country, so did the volume and sophistication of cyber attacks. Uh, right? And so uh, this is not surprising, I think. If you're, if you're the president or you're a general and you're about to go to war, well, you're going to start levying these security requirements on your people, right? And they're going to start doing them, right? Um, back to what I was saying earlier, once these agencies get all these requirements, they're, they're going to fulfill them, but in the various ways, one of those ways will be a computer network operation of some sort, where, even if it's just open source research via Google. Uh, but of course, a lot of agencies, they have more leeway than that uh, in terms of what they do. Uh, so there's defacements, uh, and as the conflict worsened in 2013, it goes from hacktivism to professional uh, computer network espionage. Uh, and then when it got cranked up in 2014, that was the most intense period, uh, there's a lot of doxing of the government. Uh, right, in terms of trying to embarrass, in terms of trying to influence uh, the United States, uh, NATO, international partners. Uh, and then the final one, we'll, we'll spend one slide on that. The, uh, the most advanced hack that the, uh, the CERT UA responded to was against their national election. Okay, the chief of Isaka Kiev uh, also is really a great guy. Uh, knows a lot about history as well as system administration. Uh, basically, he broke it down into phases of the Euromaidan, the revolution in Kiev, uh, the annexation of Crimea, and then the ongoing occupation in, in eastern Ukraine. And says so basically, there, you, know, you can find attacks in, uh, physical um, and software-based. Uh, and again, the most serious things that, that he saw were when the shooting started. So something like close to 200 people uh, were either killed or missing off the, the square there that we saw in the first slide. In terms of military, uh, you can see uh, special forces operations, actually. So uh, not only severing cables, but between Crimea and, and the, uh, in Ukraine in order to, to isolate uh, political leadership for what's happening in the military uh, terrain. Uh, also, softer things, like mass changes to Wikipedia relative to what was happening in, in Crimea. Um, and going into actually control centers and taking over a satellite, right? So this is not anything that uh, normal hackers uh, typically do. So I'm going to go through some of the, the big events that happened uh, during the course of the conflict, just so you can see that there is a... You know, there's a, a, a bureaucratic nature to hacking, and that's when you kind of know it's an APT, right? If it's not, if it's not something uh, that happens once, well, then you really don't know. But if it's something that comes again and again over time, well, then you, you, you know there's probably some kind of an intelligence bureaucracy behind this. So this was an interplay. Again, I want to speak to a, a continuum here of cyber and real world stuff. And things are going to go back and forth all the time and increasingly in the future. And then if you've seen Ghost in the Shell, right, you know by 2029, you can't even tell the difference between the two anymore. So that's probably where we're going. Um, but in this case, so this was signals intelligence snatching sort of two U.S. diplomats, their communications um, off, you know, pots or plain old telephone system of some sort, right, cell phone. And then uh, basically uploading this to YouTube and announcing it on Twitter, 
right? And this was embarrassing. If you remember, there were some not nice things said about other countries, uh, and basically a very frank discussion between two seasoned dis diplomats. But the intent of whoever snatched this information and released it into social media was to embarrass the United States and create uh, divisions between uh, Ukraine uh, and Western Europe. So here is the election hack uh, that the chapter by the cert chief goes into in some detail, but here's, here's basically the, the highlights. And again, you can see that this is not something that a lone hacker would probably be uh, capable of. Um, but there was, there was a, a serious reconnaissance and admin access, possible zero day. And then, once they're in the system, and so they can manipulate the system at will according to who wins. Now, there are paper ballots, right, of course, in Ukraine. And it's, 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 skeptics would say, well, the hackers couldn't change the, uh, the re result of the election. And that's, that's, that's true, but there's also an integrity issue. And there's the issue of trying to influence an election perhaps before, um, before the election's over, uh, such that you can tip it one way or another. And when it comes down to so many, as so many elections do, to 51 to 49 percent, then you think, well, maybe I could, as a hacker, influence uh, this thing. And finally, as soon as the elections were announced on the, uh, the election website, and, what, and, and somebody who got very, very few votes actually was announced the winner. It was the far right candidate, right? And this is what Russia tries to build up in Ukraine, that it's a, it's a government of Nazis and fascists. Uh, it was immediately broadcast on Russian television, right? Uh, so, so this is a kind of coordinated campaign. So here's the electricity grid attack of Christmas. Uh, and as, as you've probably seen, this also is, is, is an attack that requires time and effort uh, and a team mission-oriented approach, right? So you know, it's from the spear phishing uh, to the back door, disabling backup power, uh, telephone denial of service against the call centers. Um, you know, so this is uh, an, a, a logic bomb as well to start wiping computers like 45 minutes into the, into the affair. So this is something that takes time and effort to do. And then the CERT chief basically said this is the most, uh, during his tenure uh, at the CERT, was the most sophisticated attack that he had seen. And some of the analysis that's out, out there basically says the same thing uh, in that, um, you know, it's not just the malware, but it's the intent, it's the timing, it's the creativity, uh, it's the effort, that, that uh, overall effort involved. So in terms of infrastructure, of course, there's a lot of interesting things that happen. Everything's connected now, even billboards. So this is in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, so smart TVs in Ukraine were hacked, right, to display Russian propaganda. And the uh, billboard, this one, in St. Petersburg, Russia, was hacked to display Ukrainian propaganda. So if you don't speak Russian, this is, you know, please forgive us, uh, Ukraine, for having attacked you. Now, there's, an, again, this interplay between, um, between cyber and non-cyber, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but now all of us, this is one of the things I want to impress upon everyone in this room. You probably already know it. But we are all now intelligence analysts. Right? You have, because you have a computer with an internet connection, you have, re in real sense, you have as much access to information as President Obama does. Right? So the NSA and the CIA, they've got certain compartmentalized things that give specific tactical updates. You know? But the big picture issues, honestly, NSA and CIA don't know any more than does the New York Times and The Economist. Right? Or do you, if you're a good researcher? So here, what we can see uh, is that people, researchers, they're putting together um, photographs of tanks from the World Wide Web that they have that the photographs basically locate them in Russia and locate them in Ukraine. So if Moscow says we have not invaded uh, Ukraine, or as Donald Trump said the other day, Russia is not going to invade Ukraine, you can prove it, right? At least to the extent of putting together this research and citing your sources uh, and uh, making your case. 
If you haven't seen this, you should see it on Vice News. This is a tremendous story. This uh, reporter on the right basically follows a Russian soldier all the way from the Chinese border, from his home uh, to his uh, training camp in Russia, uh, to crossing the border into Ukraine, and to this is a small town in Ukraine uh, where he basically uh, was involved in military operations. Uh, so this is tremendous. He probably takes at least a dozen pictures following this soldier all the way from his base, all the way back to his home uh, in eastern Russia. Social media as well, be aware, when I ask my students in Kiev, so I teach a class at the university in Kiev, and do they see reflections of information operations within their social media space, immediately every hand is raised. And this is a famous case in which there was a fire in Odessa, um, which is on the southern coast of Ukraine. Uh, and immediately there was a lot of political uh, conflict around this uh, fire because people died, right? And so this guy, Igor uh, Rozovsky, uh, basically said, I'm a doctor trying to help people, but the government won't let me. All these people are dying around me, et cetera, et cetera. And he's calling them fascists, which is a real key word in this part of the world, right? Where World War II, at least from a Russian perspective, is, is rightfully so, a, 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 you know, the biggest moment perhaps in, in most of living memory, let's say. So, but as researchers try and see who this guy is, it turns out that there is no such person and the Facebook account had just been created uh, and the picture was from a dentist in some other part of Russia. Right, so what does that mean? This is, a, this is an information operation that is maybe tactical and certainly not decisive in any kind of war scenario, uh, but it depends. I mean, if you have a large effort, you know, moving things forward in, on many different fronts, then, then you have some kind of a cyber war element uh, to what is, is happening uh, in, in international relations and international conflict. So I live in this neighborhood. I don't know if you saw this. This was just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, but it was a prominent Belarusian journalist who moved to Moscow because he was afraid of, uh, um, uh, of what was happening in uh, Belarus. And then he moved to Ukraine uh, because he felt too much pressure in, in Russia. Uh, and so this is uh, my neighborhood. I eat just to the left of this, and my daughter basically takes dance just behind this uh, event. Uh, but he was at his girlfriend's house a couple of weeks ago, and he got up in the morning, and he's driving and just past McDonald's here on the right, and his car blows up. Right? So this is still a part of the world where uh, he is not alone. There are many journalists, and there's serious human rights implications uh, for everything. Uh, and so including being an, an online journalist. Um, so in, in the whole debate over Big Brother and in surveillance and all this stuff, it's really important to, to appreciate where, where you live if it's a, it's a relatively open free society, but also remember that, that it's a big world uh, and that it's really important, I think, to kind of limit the power of government in cyberspace because there are plenty of governments who will abuse it um, without hesitation. So cyber war in perspective, I would say that there is some kind of a continuum and it's hard to put your finger on and it's going to be moving quickly. Um, you know, between, uh, you know, that's where you remember, I'm sure some of you do in this audience, the JTF, C and D that then moved to C and O, then, then uh, greater uh, um, autonomy. Uh, it's, it's basically when you're doing cyber defense, there's an, uh, an active defense piece and you're going to be uh, basically um, doing a lot of things that might be offensive in nature. I mean, there was just a, in this morning a, a, an article uh, in the paper and, and basically the CIA official who's speaking in Aspen at their security conference said, well, we've got to get the guys before they get to CIA. So that's why a lot of our counter cyber efforts are in, involved in getting in these groups and seeing what they're going to do before they do it. So let's, let's look at this, uh, speaking of CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So uh, in Estonia in 2007, you could, you could say that this was a availability issue, right? It was a massive DDoS sort of broadside against the country. Uh, in Ukraine, I think there's a lot of integrity issues. Uh, think about the information operations and social media and the replacing of the firmware, right? And the election results. 
right? These are things we need to think about in the context of the, the DNC hack as well, right? It's protecting the democratic process itself. And how do you do that? It's kind of amorphous. Um, but this, you know, the e-voting, um, you know, how do you protect maybe candidates and parties against foreign manipulation? This is not easy. And of course, when you start doing that, then a lot of people are going to raise their hand and say, you know, government, get out. So it's not, basically it's a, it's a big challenge. And of course, down at uh, USA 2016, it's a co confidentiality issue, right? We, we never thought that WikiLeaks might be used for such a politically pointed purpose. But if you think about it, all you have to do is really time it well. So that's one of the things about the, uh, the DNC hack. They were saying that this looks like a bureaucracy because they're, they're leaking this information just prior to the Democratic Convention. So I'm involved in, in another uh, book project at Cybercom, and we're looking at grand strategy in cyberspace. And uh, you know, what can I say about cyber war? Uh, to me, there's no question it exists. Whether or not it uh, um, uh, rises to the level of some, you know, the weapon of mass disruption, let's say, um, is is another is another question. It's probably not decisive, right? But think about it. If you're a tank commander. You know, and this is an important day for you, but, but the enemy has some kind of a zero day for an operating system or application upon which you are dependent, it may be a very long day on the battlefield, right? And all these basically tanks, planes, and ships, they're all basically um, floating, flying, and rolling computers today, right? Um, so you have to be aware of that, and, and you think the departments of defense around the world are absolutely aware of that. Um, if your operating system is down or this critical application doesn't function properly, um, you, might not, you might not have a, a win on the battlefield that day. That said, Admiral Yamamoto did not intend on winning World War II at Pearl Harbor, right? Um, that was just the opening shot in what would be a long war, and they expected a very severe uh, response from the United States. So it was to gain time, to gain space. And that's probably the precisely the same way that cyber attacks would be used by militaries. Um, you know, military, uh, cyber attacks are not going to occupy ground, you know, in, uh, in, in Germany or Russia or the United States. Um, but they might facilitate, right? They might help. So turn out the lights for a while, uh, confuse leadership, just like in the Army FM, that's exactly what it said. You can attack systems, you can also attack the decision making process. So there's too many national security challenges, I think, to think about, and some of them are going to lead us toward uh, um, solutions that will be unhelpful, both for the internet and for cyberspace and for human rights, I think. Uh, but here's just some of them. Uh, relative to attack, what can you do in peacetime? Right? I'm also on this uh, Tallinn manual team in Estonia, so we're looking at how the laws of war apply in cyberspace. What can you and can't you attack? Um, you know, because again, you're going to have to be big, busy in, in peacetime if you want to be successful in wartime. So that makes deterrence very difficult. So one of the aspects of deterrence is that you have to have a clearly stated policy of deterrence and a demonstration of capability to enforce whatever policy against the adversary. And this is very difficult in cyberspace because things are so elusive, right? I mean, how many years and millions of dollars did the U.S. go after Moonlight Maze for a big question mark at the end. Who was it? Well, we think it was the Russians, but may not be. Maybe some other sophisticated actor routing through Moscow. Um, so, you know, the attribution question is very interesting. Can you get solid attribution? Can you get to the person at the keyboard? Yeah, sometimes, but you might need traditional law enforcement, you might need human, etc. But one of the interesting things about that, and this is what maybe Russia is finding out today, is you can crowdsource this as well. If Putin or Obama or some other leader really pisses off everyone in this room, well, guess what? You might do attribution pretty quickly just by good open source analysis and perhaps some hacking as well. Uh, so thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Enjoy your evening.